off. It is Palm Sunday, which is celebrating the moment that Jesus turned his face towards Jerusalem and he came into this city that he would ultimately be crucified in. And so this morning I want to speak to you about the title of my message is, He is Here. He is Here. He is Here. He is Here. Amen? Amen. Come on, Jesus is here. We're going to be in Matthew 21, 1 through 11, and also in Luke chapter 19. You know, the reality is is that people will react all sorts of ways when their favorite celebs come to town. Am I right? How many of you have kids and they have a celeb that they absolutely love and if they ever saw them in person, they would either freeze or melt or scream or all of the above? You know, we see all around our world, and some of us have participated in these moments where we would be willing to line up and camp for days just for a chance at a ticket to get in to meet or see our favorite celeb. Have you also seen some of these videos when uh, some of these Swifties get into the concerts and when Taylor walks out on the stage and they absolutely just start uncontrollably crying and weeping because Taylor has entered into the room? We may laugh and think this is silly, but who is the one person that I would ask you that you'd be willing to wait in line for, for a chance to meet? Who's the celebrity in your, so in your own mind, begin to put that in there. Who is that for you? And, and I won't deny it. I'm, I'm not perfect. There have been dozens of times in my life where I've lined up to watch my team walk off the bus and into the stadium. And this is known as the walk of champions right here. Come on. This is the walk of champions. And and even though I grew up in State College, Pennsylvania, which is five minutes from Joe Paterno, Beaver Stadium, Happy Valley, Penn State, Nittany Lions, Penn State University, uh, in which my mom and dad are here this morning, stand, turn around, wave at everyone. Come on. Stand, turn around, wave. They're visiting from Pennsylvania. Even though I grew up in a shadow of Joe Paterno, my father brainwashed me because he's from Alabama. And so ever since I can remember, ever since I was a small child, we would go down to Tuscaloosa, stay with my Uncle Ben and Aunt Zelda, and we would go to a game. And several hours before the game, what happens is all thousands upon thousands of fans, they all gather around the entrance to the stadium for when the team arrives to walk into the stadium because a chance as a child and even as a adult such as a child grown up right the chance to get to see your favorite player your favorite coach walk right by you and maybe even look at you is worth lining up for and cheering them on and uh and so this was something that i've done my whole life as we go down there the walk of champions and cheer and right here we're in the briefcase that is the goat the greatest of all time nick saban and uh, he was our coach he just retired now he's working to save college football from NIL and all the crazy stuff that's happening. But so there's the walk of champions. Then there was the time that in uh, our young marriage that we have absolutely grown in because of exo conferences and all of those things where I thought it would be brilliant for Sarah's birthday for us to go to an Alabama football game. And so uh, I surprised her with tickets to an Alabama football game for her birthday. And so we had a great little trip together. We actually went to an away game, which is a whole different experience because there's no really walk of champions there. And so, but we still wanted to see our team. We're there several hours before. Like, we wonder where the visiting team buses are going to come in at. And, and so we're walking just through random parking lots. And all of a sudden, it was just a God-ordained moment, I'm telling you. It's just her and I, and we see these buses come in. We don't know if it's the Wildcats or if it's the Crimson Tide, but as the first bus comes up, it's between, you know, from here in the front row there, uh, sitting in the very front seat was the goat himself, Nick Saban. And not only was he right there, but he turned, he looked right at Sarah and I, decked out in Alabama at an away game, and he gave us a wave. And so it was the greatest greatest moments, one of the greatest moments of my life because Nick Saban knows who I am and uh, (laughs) it was a great time. 
You see, this is in a way the moment that is happening for Jesus, that there are these crowds that have amassed and essentially they are following him, they're coming out from this city and they are welcoming him into Jerusalem. Jerusalem, it says that he set his face towards Jerusalem because he knew what was gonna happen in that city. He knew that the crucifixion awaited him. He knew that betrayal awaited, awaited him. He knew that, uh, that he was going to go through torture. He knew that he was about to suffocate on the cross. He knew that his best friends, his disciples who've been with him for three years, every single day, he sent them out and they've come back that they would abandon and walk away from him. He knew that Peter would even deny him. He knew all of these things would take place in this city, Jerusalem. He knew that he would then conquer Satan's sin and death and resurrect from the grave in Jerusalem. Ultimately, he knew he would then ascend to heaven and send his Holy Spirit upon his people right there in Jerusalem. And so in the final week of his life, there's so much that is jam-packed in it, and today is the day that we remember and celebrate he set his face towards our salvation. He set his face towards our salvation because in the first 30 years of Jesus' life, he wasn't actively launched into ministry. He was taking care of his earthly family, of his father's trade, and, and we believe it got to the point where he was able to hand that off to his brothers, and then he was able then to begin and be launched into his earthly ministry. And, and Jesus did his best as he could, but his miracles that he was doing, they were growing larger and larger, and his fame was spreading further and further and so because of this the crowds were getting bigger and his fame was growing larger and everything was coming to a head very quickly in this moment and so as Jesus is preparing to ride into Jerusalem he's actually coming off of one of his greatest miracles of all time his greatest hit of all time that yes he was healing the blind yes he was feeding thousands of people from a little lunchable yes he was helping lame people walk again but the climatic, emphatic, exclamation point miracle that Jesus is coming off that is bringing everything to a point was he raised a dead man back to life. He did. His name was Lazarus. And his friend Lazarus, who had died, he was in the grave for four days, which meant in that day, in that culture, he was medically, he was physically, there's nothing he could do. It wasn't a coma. He was literally dead. They wrapped him in grave clothes that even if he was in a coma, he would have then suffocated because of the grave clothes. He was D-E-A-D, dead. And then Jesus shows up. He says, come out of that tomb. Lazarus comes out. The crowds witness sit and all of a sudden Jesus can't run away from his fame anymore it's one thing to heal a blind man it's one thing to command a dead man to come out of a grave and so Jesus as he's riding into Jerusalem the crowds that were with him they witnessed the resurrection they're coming with him and the crowds from Jerusalem, they heard about it. They're coming out to meet him. This is the one they've been waiting for to save them. John chapter 12 says this about this moment. It says, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to bear witness. They were telling everyone, not only did I hear it, but I saw it with my own eyes. I am a witness that that man was dead, and this God man came out. And when this God man spoke to this dead man, the dead man came back alive. I saw him walk out, and his grave clothes come off, and he's alive with us now today. They were bearing witness to it. It says the reason why the crowd went out from Jerusalem to meet them was they heard that Jesus had now done this sign, resurrecting Lazarus from the dead. 
So then the Pharisees, they had said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Two things are happening here in this last part of the passage is that the Pharisees, they're looking at one another because they have already decided in the Sanhedrin, which is really the uh, legislative executive order of the religious order, they had already decided by decree that they were going to put Jesus to death. They were just figuring out how and when. And until they could do the how and when, they were trying to slow down the Jesus movement. They were trying to dis disrupt the Jesus movement. But what they're saying is, they're saying, you see that we're not gaining anything in our strategy because now it seems like the whole world is following him. And so you can imagine the picture of this moment, the crowd coming with him, the crowds coming out to him, and they're all celebrating the arrival of Jesus. So we'll get to Matthew chapter 21, our main context for today. Jesus and the disciples, they approached Jerusalem. They came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead, two of his disciples. He said, go into the village over there, and as soon as you enter it, you'll see a donkey who's tied there, and it's colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So the two disciples, they did as Jesus said. They went and they brought the donkey and the colt to him. They threw their garments over the colt and Jesus sat on it. Most of the crowd then began to spread their garments out on the road ahead of him. Others began to cut branches from the trees to spread them all across the road. Jesus then was in the center of the procession and the parade and, and all the people around him were singing and dancing and they were shouting saying, praise God for the son of David, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered and people were saying, who is this, they asked, and the crowds replied back, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, in Galilee. It's truly amazing just to picture this moment of all of these things that are taking place that as Jesus is prophetically coming into the town and the city in which he knows what's going to take place, the reaction of the crowds, not only that came with him, but those that are hearing about him and coming out to meet him, we see what the crowd and how they're reacting is that they are celebrating because when the crowds see Jesus, and what Jesus, what they've heard he's done, and what they see he's doing, they see victory. They see victory. Because many of them have not only heard about the miracles, the miraculous provisions of food, the sight that has been restored, lame who are now walking, but many of them also saw these miracles in addition to the exclamation point of the resurrected dead man, Jesus, but not only all the miracles, but then when they see Jesus, they see victory because Jesus was on a donkey. You see, this was a prophecy that was fulfilled because typically if a conquering war hero is coming into town, they're usually not riding a donkey, but they're riding a victorious horse, right? And a horse and a chariot with a battalion, but their prophecy from the Old Testament that they knew as they were all looking and searching for a Messiah, for someone to come and save them, they've been praying for it, they've been waiting for it, they've been fasting for it, they've been working towards it, they have all the signs they're supposed to know that that is gonna be their Messiah, and one of the big signs of the prophecies that is written was that their king would not come on a horse, but he would come into the city city, humble, and on a donkey. And so when they've been hearing about this Jesus guy who's claiming to be God, and they're seeing all these prophecies being fulfilled, and then they see Jesus riding on a donkey, they now are saying, Hosanna, save us, come, deliver us, because they believe he is the Messiah, because Jesus is now 
For most of the time when he would do miracles, a lot of people ask, well, why is he saying to people like when he healed uh, the demon-possessed man, he's like, go and tell nobody. And that's because Jesus somehow, with the amount of ministry he needed to do, he had to somewhat control his fame that spread in the land. Because as his fame spread, so were the people in the amount of them who wanted to murder him, imprison him, and silence him. And so there's a lot that he needed to do, but he got to the point in this moment where Jesus, when he fulfilled this prophecy of riding on a donkey, that he actually said, go grab that donkey. I'm fulfilling that prophecy. I'm riding that donkey because now he is saying out loud, this is the ultimate act where I'm visibly declaring my messianic identity. I want everyone to see and everyone to know. I want there to be absolute certainty and clarity because clarity Clarity is kindness, and I'm kind, and I want everyone to know that I believe that I am the Messiah, is what he was saying. And so how did the crowd respond? Exactly how you would expect them to respond. Exactly how you would expect a crowd who's been under Roman oppression, under Roman taxation, who's had their land taken from them. Now they're living under an occupying force. You would expect them to react how any of us would react if a Messiah was coming into our town and we were being oppressed, we would all scream out, Hosanna. We would all scream out, save us, Jesus. Save us from Rome. Save us from taxation. Save us from our oppressors. Save us from persecution. Give us our land back. Give us our religion back. Give us our freedom back. And this was what was happening in that moment. There was joy and celebration because what they've been waiting for for millennia was playing out right in front of them. What a moment. You know, many times when we read and reflect on Palm Sunday, we do what we've just done. Where we're looking at the crowd and how the crowd is reacting. But if you continue to read, what's really eye-opening was, how was Jesus reacting during this entire series of events. You could imagine, if any of us were in that position, it would be like, <laughs> right? Give it to me, this is amazing. Yes, I'm here to save you. Yes, you're right. But when the crowds, they were shouting because they saw victory, but as we'll read this morning, as Jesus was riding the donkey, he was weeping. He was weeping because he saw their destruction. The very thing that the crowds thought that Jesus was going to deliver them from was actually the very thing that Jesus saw was going to happen to them in a few short years. It was their complete and total destruction. They thought that Jesus was bringing them victory and freedom from oppression and their land back, but instead Jesus saw because they rejected him and they will reject him because they did not want who he really was, he saw that they were going to an end be destroyed from the very thing that they were wanting freedom from. So Jesus was weeping. We see this in Luke chapter 19, which is, each gospel account gives their own perspective of what's happening here at the triumphal entry. And, and any time that there's differences in these accounts, it actually strengthens the whole story. A very weak argument that people have is, oh, there's all these discrepancies in the Bible and blah, 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 blah. And most of those people have headline theology. They don't actually do the homework and research things. They just read a headline and portray it like it's truth. But when you actually dig in and see a very easy way to describe some of the discrepancies in the Gospels, it's like if four people walked and they saw a car accident happen, but they're all standing on four different 
different corners of the intersection, they're all gonna have a different perspective because they're all standing in different places, and so they saw the same thing happen, but they saw it from their own perspective. Does that make sense? And so each of the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were telling the things that people had eyewitness and seen, and they're telling the story of Jesus to us, and so we've been reading out of Matthew, we've read some out of John, and now we're looking at Luke and his perspective, and this is what he said. He said, but as he came closer to Jerusalem, as Jesus saw the city ahead, as he said that Jesus began to weep. Jesus began to weep. I don't know if you've ever wept before, but weeping is different than crying. A few weeks ago, if you were here, you saw me crying up here, and, and I heard some of you crying, so get over it, right? But weeping is a completely different story. Weeping is uncontrollable crying out. And, and so it's an interesting thing to even picture in and of itself that as Jesus is riding this donkey and the crowds are cheering in celebration, he's sitting there weeping because of his heart for them and what's about to happen to them. So Jesus says, how I wish today that you of all people, these were his chosen people. He said, how I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late. And the peace that you seek is hidden from your eyes. You're not even looking for it. You're looking for the wrong type of peace. He said, before long, your enemies, they will build ramparts against your walls. They'll encircle and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground, your children with you. Your enemies will not even leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. You see, they didn't understand the way to peace. He said it was hidden from their eyes because they weren't looking for the right peace that Jesus was bringing for them. Because they thought, and they've been praying for, they've been waiting for, that their will, because there's two different wills, right? There's the will of God and there's the will of man. And the will of man was for the Messiah to come and bring peace through the sword, that their Messiah would come and raise up an army and overthrow the Roman occupiers, that they would have their land back, that they would have their freedom back, that they would have their finances and all those things. They would have all those things back. I mean, come on, like, how could you not get caught up in this moment that, that yes, it seems like we don't have the numbers. The Roman Empire was the greatest thing the world had ever seen at that point, and they were just a small little piece of land that many nations would cross over through the trade, and, and so they were really nobody, but guess what? They just found out that their general, they would never have food supply issues, right? Because their general could just feed them out of nothing. They found out that even if they were wounded in battle, that they wouldn't have to be taken back home or, or die because of a wound, because they found out that their general can heal the sick can heal the wounded, that if they were to be wounded, that Jesus could just heal them. Check this out, they just found out that their general, even if they got to the point where they were killed in battle, their general could just say, hey, rise up. Imagine the confidence that they would have in this Messiah that there was no army on earth, there was zero army on earth that could defeat an army that could not be killed. And that was their general. But the way to peace for Jesus was not going to be through the sword, but it was going to be through nails and a cross. Because it says that peace was hidden from their eyes. What that means is that their eyes were fixed on a different kind of peace because all of this for Jesus and for God, it, it wasn't about bringing them peace in their land, between peace and their occupiers, between peace and, and the place that they found themselves in, but instead, it was about God sending Jesus to bring them peace between them and their God. 
This was the peace that they were talking about and and Jesus was weeping because even though the crowds were celebrating and they're saying, save us, save us, save us, Jesus is knowing that they're saying that in the wrong context. That they're saying, save us from Rome. They're saying, save us from our oppressors. They're not saying, save us from Satan. They're not saying, save us from hell. They're not saying, restore us back to relationship with God. They're completely and totally missing the point of why Jesus was there because they're taking their will and saying, God, do our will and not yours. And so Jesus was weeping because He knew the very thing that they thought they were getting, freedom in their land. He saw into their future a few short years later. The walls would be torn down. Men, women, and children would be slain. And the city that they thought would be the new capital of the new world would be in ruins and desolate and empty. And so Jesus wept. Jesus wept not only because they did not understand the way to peace, but Jesus was weeping. We saw at the end of chapter 19, verse 44, he says, because you did not recognize it when God visited you. That they really didn't know who was with them. They really didn't know who Jesus really was. And they really weren't responding to who God was because when you really know who's with you, you respond a certain way. When you misunderstand who that person is, you're going to respond to your misunderstanding. You see, the crowds may look different today. We may dress differently. We may look differently. And thank God we smell differently, amen? Some of us. I'm just kidding. But much has not changed since that day that Jesus rode that donkey. You see, many crowds today, they still don't understand the way to peace. They don't understand the way to peace. It is hidden from their eyes. Many people aren't even looking for peace with God or one of their gods. Many people are looking for peace here on earth. They're looking for peace the same way that the crowds were looking for peace. Peace of a circumstance, peace from a trial, peace from a situation that they find themselves in. And and so they're looking, maybe it's through the sword, maybe it's through finances, maybe it's through our smarts. and, And we see all these different things that companies are trying to do, whether we're trying to get to Mars or we're trying to put computer chips in our brains or we're trying to save the planet. We're trying to look for peace in all these different ways, but ultimately those things will not bring us peace. But even those who do have their eyes on heaven or whatever their version of that, they still don't understand the way towards that peace because peace with God is not through karma, but through a king. If you don't know what karma is, karma is this this essential, basically, your good outweighs your bad. That essentially, at the end of time, that a lot of false demonic religions, and yes, I said demonic because they are, a lot of false demonic religions, they teach that basically, at the end of your life, hopefully, your good outweighs your bad. And if your good outweighs your bad, then you go to whatever heaven is destined for you or eternal peace or eternal rest that you have. But peace with God is not through karmic debt, but through a king. Peace with God is not through a force or through force, but through forgiveness. Peace with God is not through our own punishment, but through Jesus' payment. Peace with God is not through self-actualization or a higher consciousness. It's not through Buddha. It's not through Muhammad. Muhammad, it's not through Vishnu, but it is through the person of Jesus. That is the only way to peace. But Jesus wept because this way was hidden from their eyes. They didn't see it. And we have to know today that as Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for 
for us to carry out his plan. You'd have to believe that there are moments where he weeps for those who still don't understand the way to peace. They're trying to find it through any other way. Not only did Jesus weep on that donkey because they did not understand the way to peace, but also because they misunderstood who he was and they didn't recognize it, that God was visiting them. They didn't recognize that God was in the flesh visiting with them. You know, some of us may think because Jesus went to heaven that God does not visit with us today. I would say you're misinformed or you're wrong because scripture is very true that there are two clear ways that God visits us today. But Jesus weeps not only for the moment he was in but also for us today because when he does visit us, we don't recognize that he's with us. We misunderstand and our eyes are not on him. As our worship team comes forward, as I finish, there are essentially two ways that God continues to visit us today. Yes, it was special and yes, it was powerful that Jesus visited or God visited humanity through his son, Jesus, but God equally, just as powerfully, visits us today, 2,000 years later. He visits us corporately, and he also visits us personally. His word says that corporately, and Matthew, he recorded this in his gospel. In chapter 18, Jesus stated just this, not only to his people, but a promise for us all to cling and us all to hold on to and for us all to remember. He says, when two or more are gathered in my name and in my unity, I am there with you. I'm there with you. Either we believe him or we don't. Either God is truly with us or he's not. He said, where two or more are gathered in my name, and he's speaking when he's not physically with them anymore because he's beginning to set up the disciples to help them understand that he will not be with them in the flesh, that he will be ascending back into heaven, that he will have to go through a process of the Passion Week that we're celebrating and remembering this week, that he will be betrayed, he will be killed, he will be raised again, he will ascend to heaven, and so he's trying to help them understand what will that life look like when Jesus isn't here and how fearful they may be, how anxious they may be. And he's encouraging them saying, when I'm gone, when two or more of you come together in unity under my name, I am there with you. You're not alone. And so it's true for us this morning that every time we come together on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or when two or more of us are gathered in the community, when we come together, we are unified by our belief in Jesus, by our groundness in the gospel, and we're unifying under King Jesus that Jesus is here with us. That is his message. That is his promise. That is his encouragement, that he is here. He is here. Jesus is here, right here, right now, in this room, with us. And when he is here, his presence is known, and we're aware of it, it changes everything. It changes everything. But Jesus weeps because we don't recognize that God is with us in the room. We miss it. We're focused on our circumstances. We're focused on our situations. We're taking our will and we're saying, God, I want you to bend your will to mine. In the same way that the crowds were saying, God, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. I need you to save us from Rome. I need you to save us from this. I need you to do this. 
where God is saying, I'm here to save you from eternal destruction. I'm here to give you purpose. I'm here for you to serve my will, but that ultimately brings your fulfillment. God visits us corporately. Not only does he visit us corporately, but he promised to visit us personally. This was the strength of he who is called the paraclete, which is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it is better that he goes. I don't know about you, but if Jesus said that to me, I'd be like, no, it's not. Like, you just chill with me for the rest of my life, please. But Jesus said, it's better for you that I go. Because at that moment, Jesus had taken on a human body. And for him to go back to heaven and sit at the right hand of God, he said, I'm gonna send a spirit that does not have a body for himself, but one who will fill each and every one of your bodies. The very spirit of God himself that can be everywhere at all times. And his name is the Holy Spirit. He's not an it, he's not a thing. He is God. He is God's personal spirit that is with us. And Jesus even provided this example for us. It was at his baptism. After 30 years of being with his family, he began then to step out into his ministry, but before he did, he went and got baptized in water. And and that's why we believe that every single believer should be baptized in water. Do you have to do it to go to heaven? No, but it is an example of Jesus, and to follow Jesus is to learn his ways and follow them. It's that simple. We make following Jesus so difficult, but if you just learn the ways of Jesus, and how do you do that? through reading his word, and then you follow the ways of Jesus, then you will do the things that Jesus did. And so Jesus, before he launched in the ministry, he was baptized in water. And it was in that moment that it says, the God's word says that the sky was split open, that God from heaven called down to upon his son Jesus, and he said, this is my son in whom I love and I'm well pleased, and in that moment it says God's personal spirit, it went down from heaven like a dove, and it rested and remained on Jesus. That is where we get our Trinitarian theology from. That is in one of, it's one of these moments where God the Father speaking from heaven, God the Holy Spirit is descending like a dove, and God the Son Jesus is on earth. You see all three persons of the Trinity, and and so when the Holy Spirit rests and remains on Jesus, he gets out of the water, and the Spirit leads him then into the wilderness to where then he's confronted by the enemy, and he begins his ministry. You see, everything that Jesus did, when you learn his ways and follow them, one of the biggest biggest examples Jesus gave us was how to be human and how to be led by the Spirit. Because even though that Jesus was fully God and he was fully man, this is called the hypostatic union, we can hardly understand it, but he was 100% man, 100% God, he was both. When he was here on earth, scripture says that he put his divine attributes to the side and he walked as men do in our weakness. And in doing that then, when he was rested and empowered and when he remained in the Holy Spirit, he showed you and I, men and women alike, how we walk on the power of the Holy Spirit, how we are led by the power of the Holy Spirit. So everything you see Jesus do all throughout the Gospels and you hear throughout the book of Acts, everything Jesus did was done by the power of the Holy Spirit because Jesus put his attributes to the side, me meaning we are capable of doing the same, and Jesus said even more, even more. 
because the Spirit rested and remained on him. The Spirit of God was personally with Jesus, and so at the moment of your salvation, the Holy Spirit, the the heavens split open, and the Holy Spirit descends down on you, he rests on you, takes up residency in you, and begins to remain in you. And I heard this illustration this past week I can't get away from, and it was like this, that when the Holy Spirit descended down on Jesus like a dove, you can imagine that there's a bird on my shoulder. And if I have a bird literally on my shoulder, every single step that I take, I have this bird in mind because I'm trying to take care of the bird. I'm trying to not misstep. I'm trying to make sure the bird stays there, right? Every single step that I take, I'm taking with this bird in mind. And in the same way, when the Holy Spirit comes and he rests on you and he remains in you, every single step that we take, we should have the Holy Spirit in mind. Holy Spirit, how are you leading me? Holy Spirit, what should I say here? Holy Spirit, what should I decide here? Holy Spirit, what is your will, not mine? Holy Spirit, how can you empower me? Every single step that we take. But our problem is, is we have moments where like, Holy Spirit, it's go time, let's go, let's worship, let's hear, and all this stuff. And then we go during the week and we just like, I'm gonna take the Holy Spirit off and just do my own thing. Or at times we go through a crisis and we're, Holy Spirit, go time. Holy Spirit, can you do this for me? I need you to do this for me. I need you to save me. I need you to do this. And ultimately, Jesus is weeping because we don't know when God visits us. That God is with us. So this morning, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet. And as you stretch out and and find your balance, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. Do you recognize it when God is with you? It's a real question. When we come together corporately, Do you honestly recognize that God is literally in the room? And how do you respond to that? If King Jesus physically walked here in the room, it should be no different than how we acted last Sunday. That when the king is in the room, we respond. Do you recognize that the king is in the room? Do you recognize that the Holy Spirit rests on you and remains on you and his personal spirit is visiting you day in and day out? And he's not coming and going, but he is residing in you? Do you recognize that when God is with you? So as that question is for believers, I want you to take a moment with your eyes closed to begin to look inward and say, do I, have I really been recognizing that? The moments where God is with us together and and always individually. And, And then you can ask God to say, God, I just want to become more aware that I'm always in your presence. That I'm always in your presence. It's not just at church, but when I'm driving in the car, when I'm grocery shopping, when I'm watching TV, when I'm hanging with my kids, that I'm always in your presence. When I'm alone, you are with me and I'm not alone. I'm always in your presence. And then God, not only do I wanna be aware of that, but I want to submit to your will. And ask every step that I take, how can I take it with you in mind as you remain on me? So believers, I want you to begin to respond in this moment. This is the most critical moment of the morning is when you hear the word and you respond to it as the Holy Spirit challenges you this morning. And for those of you who maybe don't follow Jesus, you've not learned his ways and you're unsure if you would even go to heaven or not, at this moment I would ask our prayer and our pastor team to 
come forward because I'm gonna give you that opportunity to say yes to Jesus. You see, it's amazing that when we hear about the way to peace, the way to peace eternally, you heard this morning is none other than Jesus himself. You cannot get there on your own or through any other medium, but it is only through Jesus. And when you hear about that, not only do you want to get to heaven through Jesus, but you want his Holy Spirit to be with you. And so this morning, I wanna give you that opportunity. If you've never said yes to Jesus and received that free gift of salvation, this is gonna be a moment for you. Or you would say, Pastor Joe, at some point in my life, I did years ago, but I've walked away and, and I am not sure if I'm really a follower of Jesus or where I would spend eternity if I were to die today. And I want to recommit my life to him, rededicate my life to him. I'm gonna ask that this is also a moment for you as well. So if no one looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would say, Pastor Joe, I want to follow Jesus. I want to receive his salvation and his spirit within me, learn his ways and follow him, whether for the first time or recommitting to that this morning, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand on the count of three, high above your head. Ready? One, two, three. High above your head if that's you. I see that hand. Incredible. Anyone else? I see that hand. Anyone else wants to say yes to Jesus? For those of you who raised your hands, why don't you take your hand and put it over your heart? Scripture says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But I'm also gonna ask you to do something that, something physical to it, because I believe when sometimes when people raise their hand, wanting something is different than doing something. And I believe sometimes when we do something physically, it does something in us spiritually. And so if you raise your hand in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to come down here to the front. I'm not giving you a microphone. We just wanna pray with you and, and celebrate you for a moment. But I do believe the moment that you step out from your chair and you come down here to the front, as you're walking, I believe the Holy Spirit, God, is gonna to begin to do a miracle inside of you in that moment. And it also gives you the reality of your decision. And so I'm gonna to count to three again. And if you raised your hand, I'm gonna ask you to boldly come down here. Don't wait. Jump down here to the front so that we can pray with you and we're gonna clap and celebrate. On the count of three, ready? One, two, three. Come on down here. Don't wait. Come on down here. Let's go.